Okay, hello everyone and welcome to, and I did count this time, the 51st VJUG session. And um, it's actually a, a special time in the VJUG. We have just hit 4,000 members. So congratulations to everyone who's joined and has made the virtual jug something, you know, a special community uh, in the Java ecosystem. So uh, thank you very much for your support. Um, Okay, so joining us today, uh, I say us, Oleg's not here, unfortunately, but we have Gleb uh, Smirnov. How are you, Gleb? Excellent, thank you. What about you? Uh, very good, thank you. And, and although we don't have Oleg with us, um, Oleg normally from Tartu, he's normally uh, um, in Tartu when he does the virtual jug sessions, and that's exactly where you're from. Right? Yeah, exactly. I'm actually sitting maybe several meters from the place where Oleg usually sits. Just that's, behind one wall. That's kind of kind of fun and a scary fact at the same time. So, uh, so that's really great news. Uh, what I'm going to do before we get started, I'm just going to quickly uh, quickly share my screen. Let me just double check everyone's uh, everyone's in the virtual jug channel. So we're recording now. Please refresh if you can't see see now because i like my hair i have to do this myself now so let's uh, let's share my screen and then i can show uh, show those who are joining how they can interact with us so um here we go for those of you who haven't uh, been to a virtual jug session before um, here's some information um, about how we work. So, yeah, we are the Virtual Java User Group, um, and today's session is Java Concurrency Under the Hood uh, by Gleb Smirnoff. Smirnoff, sorry. Um, and you can follow Gleb on Twitter uh, at GV Um A couple of things. Uh, the Virtual Jug is sponsored by Zero Turnaround, and whose media partner is Rebel Labs. And every single session that we do, we'll have a write-up with a video and speaker interview as well, and that can be found on the Rebel Labs website. Um, so Zero Turnaround is our sponsor. Uh, Zero Turnaround produce revolutionary developer tools, uh, and you're welcome to download and try a couple of their tools uh, for free for 14 days, fully featured trials. We have JRebel, which is uh, a tool which allows you to automatically reload your Java changes without build or redeploy. And we also have XRebel, a lightweight Java profiler that allows you to profile your code while you're developing with a very, very low overhead. Uh, so do try them at zeroturnaround.com for some free trials there. Um, how you can interact with the group, uh, we have an IRC channel. Uh, if you're watching through virtualjug.com, just next to this video, just to the right of this video, you'll see a widget which will allow you to log into our, uh, our virtual jug IRC. Uh, you can discuss, you can chat there, and also you can uh, paste in your questions that I will ask uh, Gleb. So if you have any questions about the session, drop it into IRC and I'll ask Gleb. And um, please do share the group and session. So you tweet about it, Facebook, tell everyone you're watching now, and we'll have people uh, join midway through. And if you have any feedback about the session or Virtual Jug in general, uh, feel free to ping at Virtual Jug or myself at SJ Maple on Twitter, and I'll be very uh, happy to hear your comments. Um, so without any, uh, any further ado, hopefully everyone's connected OK, and we're going to talk about Java concurrency um, with Gleb. So let me pass control back over to you, Gleb, uh, so mm -hmm. we can see you now. And uh, tell us about Java concurrency. Excellent. So welcome, everyone. First, let me give you a very short introduction so that all of us have the same understanding of why we are here. So basically, concurrency is something that is getting even more hyped up. Uh, it would seem ridiculous at first, but uh, with every passing year, people start getting more and more and more excited about it. A year ago, I didn't think you could be more excited, but apparently you can. But still, the thing is that it is a topic which is of a large inherent complexity. So there are a lot of spots which might appear confusing unless you spend a lot of time actually studying and investigating this thing. And what I want to do is to give some of you uh, the understanding of how this thing actually works from the inside. Because if you do not understand how, how it goes uh, how it goes down to all the way how it's implemented, you cannot really use it. For instance, I've heard uh, several times people saying, 
Um, oh, so threads, threads, no, uh, I don't really use threads. I use fibers. But well, threads are built on top of fibers. And what I really want to do is just resolve the confusion and give you the like give you the whole chain of how it all works. So I'll just start with sharing my screen. And here we go. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you. Possibly some of you already know what it is, but I'll still uh, double uh, reiterate on it for everyone. The concept of leaky abstractions. So this is something that was uh, first suggested quite a long while ago, but the basic idea is as follows. So with each abstraction level that we as engineers or pretty much anyone else uh, add, we obscure some implementation details. It gives us uh, the convenient abstractions that we can use to reason about complex things in uh, simpler ways. But on the other hand, we still hide some of those details. But the devil, as you probably know, is in the very details themselves. So sometimes things that can happen on the low level of uh, whatever it is can affect the high level behavior. The very simple and the classical example of that would be a dog biting on your internet cable and you do not have any internet anymore or more precisely your packages are not being delivered so the dog biting on the cable is something very low level but uh, your application not getting response from somewhere is very high level but the thing is that your application or the tcp standard for that matter does not have any abstraction that describes your dog right so this is a classical example of an abstraction that has leaked to investigate what is causing your packages to be dropped, you have to go deeper. And you just cannot explain the dropped packages using the high-level terms. You cannot show the very root cause without going deeper. And this is pretty much what we are going to do today. Because when you do uh, write concurrent code, you often uh, find yourself puzzled or confused uh, no matter how long you do concurrent code, how experienced in it you are, eventually you will find yourself confused. And to be able to resolve the confusion, you always have to go deeper. So we will start with uh, one kind of simple example. Suppose we have this little piece of code. So one of the threads executes this method. It just assigns some field value uh, the value 10 and then says that it's finished and then we have another thread which executes this method and it waits for finished to become true and then it asserts that the value is actually equal to 10 so if we take a look at this code it would seem that assertion can never fail right can it fail usually at this point i would ask the audience but with the virtual jack it seems a bit complicated so I will just assume that some of you say, no, it can never fail, because in the audience, someone usually raises their hands. And then some other people do not raise their hands and think that, oh, yes, this assertion can easily fail. Then there is another question, which some other people may say, uh, it depends on which hardware you run it on. For instance, if you run it on x86, it will not fail. But Really, how, how do we even approach this kind of question? What we, could we do to answer this? So there are basically two approaches. One of them would be the theoretical one. We would just take up the Java memory model, which I really hope uh, most of you are at least somewhat familiar with. Uh, in case you are not, uh, this is the document which specifies how Java uh, handles, reads, and writes what threads can observe which values written, and so on. Basically, the very documentation which you should consult to understand whether your uh, multi-threaded application is correct or not. And correctness is also defined in a very technical way. So, if we were to read the Java memory model in whole, uh, then one of the simple rules of the thumb would be that if we do not have volatile for the field finished there, then the assertion can easily fail. But it does not really have to. And then the JMM only contains the very high level stuff. Uh, as we know, Java is platform independent. 
and it has no notion of x86 in the Java language specification or the Java uh, virtual machine specification. So uh, we would not be able to answer the second part of the question using the theoretical approach. Uh, unless we go deeper even theoretically, but this is not what we are going to do. Um, uh, we will take a small detour to the Java memory model before. So one of the key concepts of Java memory model is the happens before relationship. Same key concept is a bit of a stretch because it is itself built uh, from more simple concepts, more, uh, not even simple, but more kind of low level concepts. So basically, happens before uh, is something that we will define a bit later, but uh, this is something I usually use to gauge the audience's familiarity with the Java memory model. So almost everyone usually knows what happens before is, uh, but then it changes to synchronizes with. It is a bit more low level, a bit more specialized, and people, fewer people know that. And then there is uh, this thing, which is basically the JMM itself. And not many people really have read it, and I do not fully expect you to do this, but uh, it would be nice if you did. I wonder uh, if any of you have uh, listened to Alexei Shipilov's earlier video session about uh, the pragmatics of the Java memory model. Some of the things which I'm going to tell you today, they do, uh, say some of the things that he said, maybe in other words, maybe um, in very similar words, but the thing is that concurrency is a subject that uh, easily gets out of your mind. So probably even for those who have seen it, it is still a good idea to be attentive because uh, you know what the mother of learning is, right? But this is not the point. So this whole thing, which you can currently see on the slide, it's kind of complicated and kind of, uh, we don't really want to go in there to the deep theoretical aspects of it. We would rather take a more hands-on approach. Uh, so what we are going to do is do something very simple. So how do we know if assertion is going to fail? Well, we just run it, that's it. But the problem is that if we run it once and it doesn't fail, does that mean that if we run it twice, it also doesn't fail. And what if we run it a million times? Would it fail then, at least once? So the obvious next uh, correction to our checking mechanism would be to just run it a lot of times. Well, maybe a real, real, real lot of times. And really, if we run it for like billion times and it doesn't fail even once, then well, maybe it's not even supposed to fail, right? But uh, what is more important, if we run it billion times and one of the times it does fail, it gives us very solid evidence that the assertion can fail, right? So that would be an example. So uh, a very nice thing about Java community, and I believe that you should be familiar with this tool, is that uh, it has so many stuff, so many uh, things already done for us. So. Here is the JC stress, which I also believe has been covered by Vijuk and Alexei before. And what it does is essentially what we really need. Uh, it has some different sorts of experiments, like what we want to do. Run this thing and see if the assertion fails. And it uh, runs it many, 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 many times over and just gives us the aggregated statistics on what the uh, runs resulted in. So. Uh, moreover, it contains just the very test that we want to do, because I guess we are not the only ones who are interested in whether this assertion could fail or not, right? So what we're going to do now is just open the JC stress code. Here it is. Let me zoom in a little. So what it does, it uh, defines two variables here. Let us rename them to what we had in our original example. So this was value. And well, and this was finished. We are going to 
ignore this contented thinking because it's not quite relevant to the scope of this topic, but you can easily look it up online and see what it is supposed to do. So this test is pretty much uh, identical to what we had. So we have one thread, also called Ector, executing this method. So what it does, it writes the value first one, then it also writes two, just to make the things more interesting. Then it says that it finished, and afterwards it just writes the value once more, just to make the things even more interesting. And the other thread, what it does is just, it reads the value, and it also reads the finished. It stores them into the result, and that's it. So these two methods, they are just executed a real, real, real number, uh, great number of times. So, and on the output, what we get are several possible outcomes. So zero and zero, which would stand for uh, value and finished being zero respectively, and all the other ones. And the interesting outcomes would be the cases where, value, uh, where finished was one, basically this one. But uh, in value we saw um, in value we saw zero or one. Basically, we have not seen this uh, value written. So we are going to run this. I am right now located in the JC stress repository. I have compiled it from the source, and now I'm going to run this test. So java minus jar, jcstress.jar, and then the regex which matches the name of the test. So I'm going to hit enter, then we're going to wait for some while, because obviously we want it to be run quite a number of times. I did cheat here a little, because we did not run it for a real long, but apparently it could be just enough. So we open up the resulting file, and this is what we see, unfence the query release test, and here we go. Acceptable interesting has happened some number of times. But this table is not very uh, easily understandable by eyes, so we're going to switch to a pie chart, uh, or even a donut chart, or maybe something else chart, uh, that is a bit more easier on the eyes. So here we have y, which is... Uh, in this case is always zero. So basically, when we have not observed a write to finished, this has happened uh, roughly 48% of the time, and most of the time we have also not observed the write of value. So basically it means that most of the time it was zero, zero. We have only seen, uh, we have not seen anything. But in some rare cases, while we have not uh, observed the finished field to be written, we have observed the right to x as 3. This is called the, uh, basically, a racy read. It means that we just got lucky several times, because the CPU can do a lot of stuff, and maybe the JVM can do a lot of stuff. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Let us just see the results first, and then try to explain them. So, in the other 52% of the cases, we had the uh, y as 1, basically, we have observed the, the stuff to be finished, and we have also seen x to be even 3, not just 2. But, in a very rare number of cases, we did observe x, that is, value, to be 0, to still be 0, so we have not seen that right. And if, instead of just uh, recording stuff here, if we had an assertion here, basically, um, if uh, as why this assertion would have failed, right? It would have failed about uh, seventeen thousandths of a percent uh, of the time, but it still would fail. So. This is the definitive answer to our question whether this can fail, and whether this can fail on x86. But we are not quite done yet. We can do some more experiments before we try to answer the questions which must be bubbling in our minds, like why does it fail? So, if we run it on another architecture like ARM, 
what we would observe that uh, yes still there are these failures and maybe the percentages have shifted a little so more often than not we actually see this and the number of cases in which we do not observe the read uh, the right is much smaller but still uh, it could happen Another very interesting thing that we could try is if we run it on x86 again, but this time we would use the client compiler instead of the server compiler. So if we run it here, we suddenly see that, wow, no more assertion failures or no more unobserved writes. This might come out surprising. And um, judging by the previous two graphs that we had, we would not expect this to happen, we would expect it to kind of fall, uh, fail all the time. Maybe we just didn't run it enough times, but still, this result is unexpected. So this is something that we definitely have to explain. Else long as, uh, as well as the whole failing matter altogether. So let's go ahead and try to do that. Before we uh, do it, we'll just take another look at the code. So we write the value as 10, write the finish to true, and this is a Java method. So what we want to remember is how this thing actually gets executed. So we have Java code, it translates to bytecode, and it goes to the Java machine. Hello, Duke. And from the Java machine, it does not run in vacuum. It runs on some actual operating system because the threading is different on different operating systems and whatnot. And then these operating systems, they're not also hung in the vacuum. They're running on some hardware. It could be different processor vendors. It could be different architectures. And for all I know, it could easily be the cloud. We could not know what or where it is actually running. Maybe there are like 10 more virtualization layers somewhere. But still, uh, regardless of all this, this all of these layers, they have one thing in common. Well, there is probably more than one thing, but none of them wants to be the slow one. Basically, if you suddenly find that your code is slow, you're going to uh, want to know why. And if you can point your finger at some particular CPU vendor or some particular operating system manufacturer and say that, hey, these guys, th these guys just made my code slow, my customers are suffering and whatever. And nobody wants to be that guy who everyone points the finger at and laughs and say, ha, ah, they're slow. So what uh, everyone does to like crumple their competitors is they apply some optimizations because they just want to run faster. And this is generally a very good idea. Optimizing stuff is fun and makes the code run better. But there is uh, always the other side of this word. So uh, some optimizations, they may just change the observed behavior of your program. And in some cases, it's quite OK. It doesn't break anything. But there are some other cases in which the observable behavior being changed actually breaks your logic. And this is kind of a problem because the hardware engineers or even the operating system or even the VM engineers cannot really know in advance what your code is supposed to do, how it is supposed to function and what are the things that they are allowed to change and what they cannot change because that would break your correctness. And that is a bit of a problem. But let us have a more or less concrete example of that. So suppose that uh, we have the processors and they have caches. Uh, they have caches because accessing the RAM is quite an expensive operation. It's kind of physically located quite far away from the CPU. And well, there are a lot of other stuff which may influence this. And uh, uh, this is why the CPUs just keep the copies of the data that is frequently used right nearby. So they can very cheaply, in very little amount of time, get this data and do whatever they want with it. But there comes the problem of uh, multiple cores. So these guys, they somehow have to maintain a consistent view of the memory. So if everyone just throws to the RAM all the time and basically tried, that would 
uh, defeat the whole point of having a caches. So instead, the caches end up talking to each other. Let's have an example. So we have this one CPU, and it uh, has uh, the variable finished installed in its cache, and the current value of it is false. But the variable value is not in the cache of this processor. It does not know anything about it. So to do anything, it would have to probably go to the main memory or do something else. And then we have another CPU. And for them, the situation is the opposite. They do not know anything about finished, but the value is in their cache and it's zero there. So let us look at our code again and see what happens if we look at things from the viewpoint of the CPUs talking to each other. So what we do is we say, okay, let us assign 10 to the value. And then the CPU says, okay, let's see, value, value, value. Aha, uh -huh. it is not in my cache. So I should probably tell everyone else about this, my intention to write. So hello, CPU2. You know, I am going to write something to the variable value. Of course, the CPUs do not talk about variable names. They talk about addresses, but for the simplicity's sake, we are going to assume that they reason about variables. And the CPU2 is going to think, hmm, yeah. So if, if you could just, yeah, I think, yeah, okay, great. I will invalidate this. And then invalidating basically means that I will just drop this away from my cache because whatever you are going to write uh, it will make whatever I have right now obsolete, so I'll just get rid of this. And then the CPU1, after a while, will finally receive the confirmation that it has been invalidated. Then it will say, okay, nice, I have written the value to be 10, and now I want to write finished as well. And the problem here is that, that between the two right operations, a lot of time has passed. I was not talking <laughs> just for fun. I was just trying to mimic how long it takes for the uh, CPUs to communicate to each other and to make this thing happen. So while this was happening, the CPU, the CPU one, which was supposed to write finished, was in fact stalled. It was, was just waiting for the other CPU to confirm that it has removed its uh, value. And in the meantime, it like could have done so many other operations like additions or something more complex, but still it's a lot of wasted time, not nice. Someone would point the finger and say, this CPU is so slow. So the CPU engineers had to come up with something clever, optimizing. Let us just go back to this situation and try again, but with an optimization this time. So we tried to write 10 to the value, and instead of waiting, this operation is executed asynchronously. The other CPU maybe just gives us a promise that, okay, I will really, I will really invalidate this, okay? And we immediately act upon it. Or maybe in some other implementation, it may happen differently. But basically, the, uh, what happens is that it is executed asynchronously. And then the finished equals true is also executed asynchronously. And you should be very familiar with what could happen to stuff if it is executed asynchronously without any restrictions or limitations. Things tend to just get awry. And this is what would happen and the assertion would fail, quite likely. So this is the reason why we need such a thing as a memory model in the first place. Let me remind you that us software engineers, we know quite well, well, uh, it is a bit of a stretch, but we are at least supposed to know how our code is supposed to work. And let us assume that we definitely know it better than the hardware engineers or the VM engineers. They just do not know anything about our code. Okay, this is also a bit of a stretch, but still. So we somehow want to relay this, our precious knowledge of how our code is supposed to function to the execution environment, be it the JVM, the CPU, or 
pretty much whatever else is in between. And uh, for this purpose, we have what is called the memory model. And uh, like one person once said, the memory model is kind of a trade-off between three things. So the first one of them is uh, how messed up actually writing code in the given languages. Because if your memory model is um, not very coder friendly, then you are going to end up with a lot of pain in the S because take uh, the old times where you had to write specific stuff for every single CPU, like in the like in PureC or assembly, that would like you would end up tearing your uh, hair out because it's a lot of frustration. But uh, the other edge of the sword is how um, well all those language uh, runtimes are also written by someone. So they want it to be fast and correct. But if uh, you get a lot of leeway, uh, the software engineer which uses the language, uh, it is simple for him. That complexity does not just disappear. It has to go somewhere. And it would go to the implementation of the language itself. Or the third option, it would be uh, in the hardware itself. So if the hardware provides very difficult or provides pretty much next to no restrictions on how it executes the code, then it would be very difficult to write something about, uh, to write something generic that works on it in a fast and correct way and so that it is also easy to use. And uh, on the other hand, if uh, the hardware itself makes everything very easy for the programmers to write concurrent code, well, that complexity just goes to the CPU, right? And the author of this quote is, of course, Alexei Shipilov, who has gotten a lot of mentions in this session. And yeah. So one of the concept, key concepts of memory barriers, uh, pardon, one of the key concepts of uh, a memory model is a memory barrier. Basically, what, uh, if we pretended that our um, Java code could have some magical instruction, which we would cave, call for the simplicity of sake magic unicorn, that would prevent this from happening. Basically, from the viewpoint of another thread, uh, we would never see the finished to be written it would never look as if finished were written before value was, because this magic unicorn it kind of prohibits this scenario altogether. The only problem here is that, well, we are pretending, because in Java there is no such thing as a magic unicorn in the standard library, at least yet. The actual stuff is a bit more complex than that. Java doesn't reason in terms of uh, this, but we really should know this. Suppose that we are on a level below Java, and there are two types of memory op operations. Uh, write and read, also called load and store, and short uh, for them is ST and LD, which is something that you could often see in the sources of Hotspot and pretty much everywhere else. And uh, it is an important distinction that uh, if we were to restrict all the possible reorderings of the memory, well, it would be kind of slow because sometimes it's fine to reorder a store in the load, nothing bad could happen. And some other times it's not okay to reorder a store in a store because just this is the way we wrote our program. We can accept some of the stuff and we cannot accept some other stuff. So uh, this gives this distinction gives us a more fine-grained control. Basically, it allows us to introduce a memory barrier of a compound type, like XY. I will give it a formal definition now, where, of course, X and Y take the values of store load. So for X and Y, in store and load, we can have the memory barrier of type XY in which all of the operations of type X, as we can see here, that precede, that is, are located 
just before in the instruction pipeline or whatever, before the XY barrier, they will complete before any of the Y operations succeeding that barrier starts. So I will just allow you a few moments to sync this in. So we have the memory barrier of types X, Y. It's right here. We have uh, X operations before it and Y operations after it. And the memory barrier says all of the stuff which is before me has to complete before anything after me starts. Let's go with the picture instead. So if we assume X to be store and Y also conveniently to be store, then we issue a store store memory barrier here. It would mean that if uh, someone, be it the JVM or the processor or whatever, wanted to, for some reason, put this store here or put some of these stores here before the memory barrier, it would not be allowed precisely because the memory barrier is here. On the other hand, this one, the load instruction, it is not a store instruction, right? So it's quite safe to just take this and put it here. And also, of course, the other instructions like add, it's quite easy to put them to other places. And the reason uh, at this point you might be wondering, why the hell, why would anyone just reorder my instructions like this? And the reason to that is, as I hope you might guess, the optimizations. Because the runtimes, the processors, and all of the stuff which is in between is very keen on optimizing your code and squeezing every last bit of performance out of it. So it sometimes does seemingly counterintuitive stuff to it. But uh, if it can predict that uh, you are going to need to load something, why not just load it quickly? If it can, uh, uh, if some load takes a long while, why not just start doing something different, etc., etc., etc. Basically, the CPUs are really, really clever, and so are the optimizing compilers. They can do a lot of stuff, and we uh, kind of have to watch out for that because we do not want them to break our stuff. So that being said, there is another uh, piece of like introductory terminology that everyone needs to be familiar with before we can continue. So this is a quote from the um, from the Java memory model specification. I'm not sure. It's probably a quote, but anyway. So some of you might remember the synchronizer with thingy. And one of the uh, things that are connected with the synchronizers with relationship are the volatile reads and uh, stores. So uh, what happens is that when you write to a volatile field, like here, volatile store of, uh, say, field F of object A, you want to write one here. And this is basically releasing this one uh, to the uh, to ev for everyone who cares to acquire it and in this scenario if uh, you acquire it uh, it means that the, they are connected with a synchronizers with edge i have not actually given a very formally correct explanation of this but we will see this a bit later but uh, what uh, you should understand at this point is that Whenever you store something to a volatile field, you basically release some values. The, all of them which came before the volatile, you also have to release them. And whatever comes, uh, whatever is being read after you read the volatile, it will also be there because you kind of acquire it. And at this point, you will also see whatever has been released whenever you acquire. Uh, I hope that made sense. But if it didn't, we will just come back to this question a bit later again. So actually, Simon, uh, this point would be quite good to have any like buffered questions about the whole uh, stuff that we have seen before, because we are going to like 
have a dramatic twist. Yeah. Are there any questions? Okay, so yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, nothing too much yet, but if anyone does have any questions, uh, please fire them straight into IRC and I'll uh, ask Gleb uh, straight away. So we have one question from uh, Marius Philip. Um, he's he's asking about the actor annotation. Um, do you know where that was, if that was taken from anywhere? He's wondering if it was taken from Acker. Oh, um, okay. So the actor annotation, this is actually a part of the JCS dress. It was not taken from Akka. Um, actors are not specific to Akka, of course, although they make a very heavy use of it and are basically built on top of the actor model. But um, yeah, this is not related to Akka in any way. It is a just way to say that this, is, this method is something that should be executed in a code and uh, it is an actor, it just acts. That's it. Okay, awesome. Uh, another question from Crew4OK at IRC. Um, he's got a question about JC Stress. Um, he says, I heard it's kind of internal open JDK projects. Can it be used as a standalone harness like JMH? Okay, so the question, um, yeah, I don't have to repeat the questions, everything is heard. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, yes, JC Stress indeed uh, is a part of the tools of the OpenJDK. Uh, I'm not sure what you want to use it for. It is used for, um, the current use is uh, just checking whether the JVM implementation follows the JVM specification. So this is something that uh, the OpenJDK Open JDK project uses internally to catch concurrency bugs in implementing the JVM. What you potentially could use it for is uh, to just test if your code is correct in the sense that you have written some piece of complicated concurrent code and you know how it is supposed to behave and what the like, expected outcomes are and then you can just run it many, 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 many times and see if any unexpected outcomes happen. So yes, this is something that you could use it for. But basically, it's mostly a research tool and uh, for the Open JDK project, a verification tool. Okay, cool. Uh, we'll take one more question and then we'll uh, jump back in. So the question is from Carl Jockel. He and Carl's asking, uh, is there a lot of variation of the handling of concurrency between the x86 and ARM architectures? Um, between x86 and ARM, there are not so many. I could easily refer uh, to a paper which describes uh, the differences in like concurrency guarantees given by different platforms. I can do this at the end of this talk. OK, awesome. So that's all the questions. Thanks for the questions, everyone. And uh, back to you, Gleb. Excellent. Now that everyone has conveniently forgotten what the uh, acquire and release semantics are, uh, we will just very conveniently move on. So what we want to do is to actually take a peek into the JVM and see how this stuff is implemented and how our volatile instruction is actually, how does it actually work? Why aging a volatile stops the assertions from failing? How does this volatile instruction interact with the JVM, with the hardware, and whatever other layers of abstractions are there to just mess with us. So this is basically the key thing that I hope people will understand. This, uh, this will link together the different assorted pieces of knowledge that you might have from how things work on the CPU level, how they work on the inside the JVM, how they work from the Java memory model point of view just to see how these concepts relate and how they flow into each other as we dive deeper and deeper. So before that, let us uh, have a quick look at how the JVM is implemented from the inside. Here is a very simple chart for this. Oh, no, sorry, this is not the right chart. Okay, I somehow put the class diagram of my recent uh, pet project here, but let's just assume that this is the source code of your application and uh, let's see what happens to it when we put it into the JVM. So first we have the source and uh, it is given to the Java C compiler. It outputs bytecode, as I guess everyone knows. 
And this bytecode is then fed to the front when you try to run your application. It is fed to the front end of the JVM. The front end is basically responsible for parsing the bytecode and uh, getting a, an intermediate representation out of it. It's called the HIR, or high-level intermediate representation. It, it's funny, actually, because the, when you compile your Java application into bytecode, it uh, turns into some very simple instructions. And uh, when the front end is done with it and it transforms it to the high level intermediate representation, it kind of tries to reason about what originally was in your Java application, what were the for loops, what were the whatevers, because uh, it is much easier to reason about them and apply optimizations. Yeah, optimizations, let's get to that. So the high level intermediate representation is fed into the just-in-time optimizing compiler. So what it does is it takes your code, looks at it, and thinks, ha, huh, OK, I think I can safely just remove this piece of dead code. It's not used anywhere. I'll just throw it away. Or, hmm, I think I can unroll this loop. Or I think I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. And uh, with, it is not just done in one step. It is done like in multiple passes. So Sometimes you can only apply, um, after applying some optimizations, you suddenly find yourself that you can, wow, you can apply some other optimizations because the code has become more susceptible to it. But uh, in the end, the JIT optimizer outputs something that is called a low-level intermediate representation. It means that it, all the like, high-level concepts like loops or branches are pretty much gone from it. and uh, so it already resembles something which is very similar to the machine code, but it's still just an intermediate representation. And the next step would be the backend of the compiler. And that would be something that already outputs uh, from the low-level intermediate representation actual uh, native code, which is uh, corresponding to the, uh, to the architecture which you are running on. So there are like many backends for different architectures, of course. And that native code finally goes to the CPU, then uh, whatever happens, happens, and then you eventually get your profit. Because this is why we are running all of our code, right? So I hope that this has made it more or less clear to you how the JVM functions. And what we're going to do now is we're going to actually just go there. Easy, right? Well, kind of easy. There is just one problem. It is not exactly obvious. Um, where do we start? So to answer that question, we would need to find some kind of an entry point. And uh, there is a very simple way to do this. So we have this, not this, this example of volatiles, right? We have, uh, this is the example which we were uh, looking at when seeing the slides. And now what we're going to do is we are just going to say volatile right here and see what this results in. So what we could do is we could try to compile this thing. Um, where are we? Excellent. Let us go to the appendix and just build. Is that it? Oops. Compile Java. OK, so now in the uh, in the build, we have classes. And one of them here is our volatile example. So what we are going to do is we are going to just take a look at the uh, bytecode of that class. Because that was the first step, right? Java P minus T.
So this is the code of our, the bytecode, which is corresponding to the actual Java code, which we saw. So here's the two methods. First of them is executed on CPU zero, and the second one is executed on CPU one. So we're going to skip some of the stuff and only go to the very interesting one. So we have a put field here of value. And then we also have a put field here of finished. And in between, we do not actually seem to have anything useful. So this is the uh, iconst one is basically putting one on the stack, which is true. And that's it. There are no special stuff here in the bytecode. Hmm. I guess they did not put any uh, memory barrier here. Okay. And on the other method executed on CPU one, we have the corresponding get field and another get field. Uh, never mind the assertions disabled stuff, it's not quite relevant. But what we did find from here is these two things, put field and get field. These are the entry points which we could easily use to dive deeper into the JVM. So we are going to just do the very simple thing, copy this put field thing, go to the um, source code of the JVM. So I have just cloned it. Let's suppose I have just cloned it. And what I want to do is just find whatever happens to my put field instruction. Seems simple enough, right? So I'm going to do just grep minus run put field in this directory and see what happens. Hmm. Oh, well, kind of a lot of stuff seems to be happening. There's probably a good reason for that because the JVM kind of has quite a lot of source code. So it's very, very just to try and see every possible, um, every possible match of put field, we would spend quite a lot of time. But before we went here, we did not look at uh, how the JVM works for no reason. We want, uh, we do know that uh, there should be some kind of a front end that takes the bytecode, right? So we will just be very sequential and we will look for the front end. First, let's see what actually is located in this folder in the JDK. So blah, 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 uh -huh, hotspot. Hotspot is the name of the JVM. So let's go to hotspot and see what's here. Ah, in hotspot we have SRC, so we will go there, SRC, share. So the front end, uh, this CPU OS and OS CPU are probably stuff which is specific to different CPUs or operating systems. And the front end should not be specific to it because the bytecode is cross-platform. So we'll go to share and there is the VM, okay. There's still a lot of stuff, but let's see, maybe we don't find as much stuff right now. Hmm, quite a bit of fewer stuff. So let's see, what do we have here? Okay, sorry about that. Let's do it again with the clear screen. Ah, shark, not something very interesting. Opto, not yet. Interpreter, probably not. What else do we have? CI, class file. Hmm, class file is interesting. What else? Graph build. Oh, wait. Graph builder. This does sound quite right. Because, you know, uh, we are supposed to build some kind of a intermediate representation, right? And the code at that point is obviously represented like a graph. So why not go there? This C1 thing, it stands for the client compiler. And it is actually a good idea to go there because the server compiler is very, very complicated, uh, at least for a short talk like this one. So we're going to go into the C1 compiler and see how it, what it does when it encounters a put field instruction. So we are going to fire up NetBeans. Actually, I've already done that for us. So src share em c1 and graph builder right here. Okay, so this is some method which 
goes over all the bytecodes in your uh, in your class file, and just depending on whatever it encounters, it does something. So here is the put static, get field, whatever, whatever, whatever. But we came here for the put field. Let's see. So what it does is that it creates some kind of a store field thingy, and then it appends it somewhere. Let's see, what does append do? So graph builder, append, blah, blah, blah. Okay, clearly this just uh, puts the new thing into our intermediate representation. And if that were true, then store field would just be a kind of a node in the intermediate representation. And yes, a leaf is a kind of a node, right? So what we have seen is that the intermediate representation now contains an, a store field operation. So what we want to do now is see what actually happens to the to this store field uh, nodes on a uh, on the lower levels. So we're going to take that and when don't we just make a grep again? So field in C1, right? Because we are interested in C1. And uh, we do not have as much stuff now. So we have some canonicalizer, graph builder, we already saw that. LIR generated. Oh, wait. LIR generated. Hmm. Nice. Let's see. So we have this two store field thingy in the low-level intermediate representation generator. Let's just go there then. Net beans. Hello, net beans. Store field. Ah. So this is the method which processes the store field uh, instructions in the uh, in the low-level in the high-level intermediate representation and uh, turns it into the low-level intermediate representation. That seems right. This is what is supposed to happen, right? So, what we immediately, what immediately catches our eye is this little flag is volatile. So we check if the field is volatile and depending on it, we're going to do different stuff. Looks good. Let's see what that stuff is. So if we scroll, 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 this is something that is not relevant to the uh, subject of concurrency quite. It is more about uh, a neat paging thingy is about class loading. And we're just going to very conveniently skip this thing because it's not very relevant and just go next. Aha, another check. So if the field is volatile and the um, runtime is, if we are running on a multiprocessor environment, then we are supposed to add some membar release thingy. This is interesting, quite interesting. If we go inside, we will see that it is again append some LIR membar release thing. Let's remember it for now and go back and see what we do next. Okay. Then uh, there is another uh, thing which we should do. Uh, if some of you remember the Java language specification, then you would remember that uh, the long and double fields, if they are not declared volatile, they can actually be uh, subject to word pairing, basically 32 bits written at a time. So if you do not declare your double or long field as volatile, you might end up uh, reading just a half of them, just 32 bits. But if it is volatile, then it is uh, the requirement to always make the write in an atomic way. So this is what happens. Volatile field store is basically some number of hacks using the FPU and this is what happens. This is not something that we will go into because it's not the subject of our talk, but still, it's an interesting thing. 
Another interesting thing, which is also beyond the scope of the subject, is that there have been experiments run again by Alexei Shipilov to make all the longs and doubles atomic, because uh, the modern hardware actually is mostly 46-bit, right? And having all these old-school restrictions on the 32-bit is not quite relevant, and uh, to get to avoid word tearing, we would have to declare the field volatile, and it is more expensive. So, okay, this is something like for extra reading. If you are interested, I can just post the link. So, otherwise, we just do the actual store, which is again just appending an operation, which is a store to our low-level intermediate representation. And the last thing that we do is, if we are volatile, we append yet another member. This time, just member, without acquire or release or anything. And now, the next thing that we can meanwhile look at is also the load field, because it's very conveniently located right nearby. But before we go there, let us just see what happened. So, what we had is, was a store Okay, so what we had at first was the put field on the bytecode level, right? On the bytecode level, it was put field. Then we went into the... Um, then we went into the graph, and in the graph it looked like a store field. leave. Then we go even deeper and we are on the low level intermediate representation level and then here something interesting has happened. So what we see on the lower level is first the member release plus a store plus a member. So we have seen the complex instruction of storing a volatile field being broken down into several smaller instructions, which are more low level. And this is what I was speaking about earlier. The more low level you get, the more, uh, the closer to hardware the stuff gets. So what we would expect is a very similar thing to happen to the load field, right? Let's quickly look at it. So yes, is volatile. So, before we check if uh, it's volatile, we do the atomic access to the volatile fields, which are long and uh, double, that makes sense. And then, if it's volatile, we also do the memory barrier acquire. So here, for the... for the... Uh, for get field, what we got instead was this one bytecode was get field, this one was load field, right? And this one was a load plus member acquire. Does that make sense to you? No, oh, you can't answer anyway. But I really hope that it does, so far. Let us uh, think about the reasons for these memory barriers first. So, like I said um, before, there, this is the semantic of acquire and release. Um, let me get this here on one screen. So, what we have first is we want to put some field. And what we do with that, the semantics of the Java memory model, they require the volatile fields, like we have here, uh, for all the writes that have happened before the write to a volatile field to also be seen by all the reads um, that are after the read of that volatile field. So let's make it put field of x, uh, store field of x, store of x, and here it would be load of x, load of x and get field of x. So, 
if we had something other than x being stored before, actually, let us make it, sorry, not uh, x, but finished. This is what our example looked like, right? So we had finished here. Right? So instead of just get field finished, we had uh, something more complex. Because if we had here first put field uh, value, then uh, here we would also have value. And here we would have this thingy. But what we want to happen is this store to be also be guaranteed to be visible here. So this store to value must be visible here. And this release is the very thing that guarantees it. So when we say release, it means that whatever came before this memory barrier, like this store, must be released. It must be completed before anything afterwards starts, like this store. So this one must be completed before this one. And likewise here, when we say acquire, it means that whatever comes after me must already see all of this stuff. It's guaranteed to happen. And uh, having these two working in tandem gives us the very stuff that we require. But there remains one question of this memory barrier. Why do we need it then? This might uh, be uh, surprising unless you know the memory model well enough. And you would know that uh, volatile stores and loads are the so-called syn synchronization actions. And for them, there is a total store order. Uh, sorry, not just the total order. Basically, it means that any volatile operation, for any two volatile operations, you can tell which one came before. And uh, this memory bearer is the only thing that uh, actually makes it happen. Because if it were not here, then we could also have some uh, other, for instance, um, what would it be? Say a load. a load x, y, z here. And if we did not have this memory barrier here, or maybe a store as well. If we did not have this memory barrier, we would not be able to say that this one came later because that would break the Java memory model. And this memory barrier here is exactly for that purpose. Of course, we could have also put it here instead of um, afterwards. But uh, as you probably can imagine, the volatile reads are much uh, more frequent operations than volatile stores. So we put it here on the store because it's uh, not as frequently executed. Now that we have sorted this out, and I really hope that everyone uh, understands this, we're going to go one layer deeper. So what we want to do is we want to see what actually happens with all this um, member stuff. So what happens on the hardware level? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this memory barrier release and find its usages and then see what happens. So here we have the LIR assembler and assembler does sound like something that is very close to the native code. So we're just going to go there and see what happens. So if the assembler, which takes the low level intermediate representation and turns it into actual native stuff, uh, when it encounters the member release instruction, it just um, does nothing. Wow, this must be a bit of surprise. We came all the way long and we see that it does nothing. But this is the trick. 
in the very beginning, we did have this very small question about x86. As you can see here, let me just zoom in for you, we are in the very platform-specific file. So on x86, the uh, architecture itself does not uh, act uh, in such a way that we actually need this memory barrier. It means that the architecture already has taken care of it for us. And this is something very nice for of x86 guys to do. There are other architectures like Alpha in which the whole thing is very messed up. Thankfully, it's not in use anymore. And probably uh, the whole complexity of developing for Alpha is one of those reasons, but probably not the only one. So the same thing happens to the memory barrier acquire, which means that uh, we do not need, really need anything to do anything on x86 to enforce these things, because x86 already just works in such a way that uh, this, uh, the reordering would not happen. It already has the so-called total store order, which means that for any two stores, you can tell which one came before them. And this is the requirement that we have for volatile fields. One of the requirements, and it's enough to satisfy it. But then we have this other memory barrier. And it is like the store load barrier, which means that um, this is the very store load barrier that we had right here, which we put here just to make the whole volatile uh, total, total order work. And uh, here, uh, it actually resolves to some actual stuff. So let's take a look at this. And here we see a very, very large comment and just a small piece of code. If you were to guess who this comment was written by, it would again be Alexei. And the whole thing about this is that it is yet another very good optimization. But we are not going to go into it again. If you want to have the details, you can just go to his blog and read about it. I can easily give you the link for that. For now, we are going to assume that the optimization did not happen for the simplicity's sake and see what happens. So what we do here is we, if we are running on a multiprocessor machine and we need to do this basically, if we have a store load, and it is a store load, we do the locked, locked instruction of adding um, zero, right, to the pointer to the top of the stack. Hmm. It would seem that we are doing nothing. But that thought, of course, would be misleading. We would not be... Uh, doing this if it were for nothing. So the idea here is that what we want to happen is we want to prohibit the CPU from uh, reordering the, or more precisely from executing stores and load out of orders. So it cannot put the store after a load and vice versa. So there are many ways to do this. One of the such ways would to actually be using the hardware instruction of mfence, uh, which is right there, and it just tells the CPU that whatever came before me has to complete, uh, and please do not uh, start executing like memory reads and writes after um, uh, until the stuff before me has completed. But um, there are subtle stuff about this again. What we are doing instead is we are basically executing a locked instruction of adding zero. And it means that we are kind of doing this in an atomic way. And this has the beneficial side effect of also uh, guaranteeing uh, the store load semantics that we want to get. The key outtake here is that, well, this very, very low level uh, hardware stuff is uh, full of unobvious things. And there are a lot of things which are specific to the platform. So 
what I really hope everyone would do is that they would uh, just rely on the Java memory model. Because what if suddenly your application migrates to a different architecture and you kind of thought, okay, I'm running on x86, so probably I don't need this memory better, so I won't make this field volatile. And then next thing you know, you're running on another architecture and your application crashes in production and you lose a lot of money. Not nice, right? Another very important thing is that, do you remember uh, how we ran the stuff? Uh, first, we ran with the client compiler and uh, it failed. And with the, uh, sorry, when we ran with the server compiler, it failed. But when we ran with the client compiler, it did not fail. And this is the very reason. No, on no uh, step on the way we have taken uh, here, there were no smart optimizations applied to this one. Because the client compiler is not particularly smart. It's meant to be very quick, but not very uh, heavily optimizing. The much more clever server compiler can easily do some of the reordering here. And unless you have the volatile, even running on the x86 hardware will not save you from the JIT compiler. So yet another time, I would like to iterate that you really, it's a really good idea to study the Java memory model. And uh, when you write the concurrent code, just um, try to adhere to it and the best practices that it dictates. But sometimes, if you need to squeeze the last bits of performance out of the thing, you would eventually end up thinking and reasoning in terms of the memory barriers and whatnot. And as I try to remind you again, uh, it is very beneficial to just know how this stuff actually works. And sometimes you can, uh, from this knowledge that you probably have gained today, you can easily reason about what stuff uh, works faster and what stuff works slower, because this is one of the things that uh, can affect your application quite a lot. And the last thing that I hope I have done is I kind of opened you to the beautiful world of just digging through the open JDK sources and figure out, figuring out how this stuff actually works because this is something that can like, save you a lot of time and uh, a lot of trouble. If you can just go inside the JVM and see what is happening, you will just not have to go to Stack Overflow. And sometimes there is no answer on the Stack Overflow. So with that said, here are some of the useful links that I have mentioned before. So this first paper, has the comparison of different uh, architectures and what memory barriers you need on them and how different architectures use them, plus the much more detailed uh, description of uh, the cache coherency protocols. This is the blog of Alexei Shipilov, who I have mentioned quite a number of times today. And a lot of the stuff that we have covered today has much more in-depth uh, investigations happening there. Then there is the mechanical sympathy block, which is all about making your code more hardware friendly, or like the name suggests, sympathetic to the, uh, basically, basically being mechanically sympathetic. Then is the silo botany so the block by Nitsan, which has quite a lot of interesting stuff on concurrency and performance. Then there is of course, humbly my personal blog and uh, I have a list of people on Twitter who you might want to follow if you just want to learn more about Java concurrency and whatnot. And here is the QR code if you want to see this presentation again, but I guess the link will just be posted. So this is it. Awesome, thank you very we much. We have uh, new questions. Yeah, we have a, we have a few questions. Um... And uh, actually, a few are actually about those <laughs> about some of the links. Okay. Um, about about uh, which you know where where do people then go to find more information? And, uh, and I noticed you had quite a few there. A couple of others that are in um, that are in the uh, IRC are the art of multiprocessor programming. Uh huh. Um, and also Java concurrency and practice by Brian Gertz has been. Uh, 
has been suggested by Amelia H. Yeah, but both of these are very good books. Okay, awesome. Indeed. One other question um, is talking about um, everyday use cases, I guess. So this is kind of, uh, this is from uh, Salimo, Gyro, and also a little bit from Carl, um, about more information for uh, what people will really need to understand uh, in their day-to-day -day Java development. How, how deep do they need to go, I guess? Um, it really depends. So most of the time you would probably not need this thing that I have explained today, but some in some rare cases when you would just, uh, either you need to make something work really fast or you find yourself confused and you do not understand why, um, why something is happening. For instance, why is this thing so slow? What can I do to make it fast? Or why do I suddenly get these errors? because writing concurrent code is actually not easy. And uh, having can, a solid understanding of why all of this is the way it is. Why do we have this weird memory model with these weird requirements? Because hardware works this way and we kind of need to do, um, to uh, make it work on hardware. So um, in, on the one hand, you do not really, need all of this information on your day-to-day -day basis. But on the other hand, this is the information that kind of makes your uh, internal model of the Java concurrency kind of better. And that way you can uh, think about it more efficiently and spend less time wondering and okay. being just more confident in what you do. So another question, um, this is from Jeho, who's been waiting a while uh, with this question. Um, so thanks for staying on, Jeho. Um, and he's actually referring to your to the to the to the last slide before you did that that your main demo, um, mm -hmm. asking how it relates to interpreted mode, so non-JIT compiled code. Uh, the I guess this is the slide which is being talked about. So um, the interpreter, uh, yeah, kicks in just about here after the front end the interpreter just goes over the bytecodes and uh, executes them. So it uh, kind of works quite differently from the compilers you might expect. So it just uh, inserts quite a lot of um, memory barriers and synchronization stuff. So it's a different topic entirely. And uh, the more important thing is that the interpreter is only active for a short while for most of the code. So with the tiered compilation and uh, a lot of other stuff going on in the JVM, it's quite plausible that most of the code will only spend a very short amount of time in being in the interpreter mode. And you would probably not really care about the code that gets stuck there for a long while because it barely gets executed. Okay. So we don't have any other questions in the IRC, but what I am putting in there right now is um, a link for the replay. Um, uh -huh. It's one of those. It's one of those sessions that I think people will watch a couple of times just to fully understand. Um, so, uh, so I've posted the link into IRC. So feel free to uh, to go to that, um, or alternatively, um, uh, also check out uh, Alexi Shipleves, which I've also posted in uh, the chat a, a while back. Uh, you can, of course, go to virtualjug.com and watch any of those replays as well as all our uh, all of our others. Um, yeah, no other questions in um, in IRC. So it just leaves me to thank you, um, uh, thank you, Gleb, for a great in-depth session. It's great to have those on the VJUG, and I think we'll probably try yep, for thanks for having me. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, it's our pleasure. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening as well and joining us. And uh, our next session uh, will be next month. I haven't got any sessions up on Meetup, but don't worry, I do have plenty of sessions planned. It's just a case of getting them up in uh, in the right time. So uh, yeah, we've got a couple of sessions uh, lined up, um, including including a type type session. So that will be an interesting one uh, from Janice Boner as well. Um, so yeah, thanks, Gleb. Do stay on, and we'll run through a quick interview straight after this. Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, see you another time. Bye.